speaker series, and we are honored to be, uh, or I'm honored to be chatting with two wonderful photojournalists today. Um, my name is Arshia Khan, if you don't know me. Um, I lived in Little Rock for a long time. I'm in Springdale now, but I'm a photographer and a designer and an artist. Um, so this talk is very near and dear to my heart. Um, a couple of brief notes about this program. Um, this is in, in honor of J.N. Heskill. And he was the editor at the Arkansas Gazette for over 70 years. Um, and for those of you that um, aren't familiar with him, he was also um, a big, uh, I lost my train of thought, sorry. Uh, he was the Arkansas Gazette's esteemed editor. Um, like I said, he worked there for 70 years and then all the donations from this program um, are uh, go towards the permanent endowment to support speakers and programs honoring his commitment and his, uh, his commitment and excellence to journalism. Sorry, I've had a long day and I'm losing my words today. Um, moving forward, uh, it is my honor and absolute privilege to introduce our two incredibly talented um, photojournalists and artists this evening, Josue Rivas and Sebastian Hidalgo, um, both incredibly talented. If you have not seen their work or followed them on Instagram already, you definitely should. I will add links in the chat for you to do so. Um, the program tonight, I will introduce both of them separately, and then they will have some short presentations to share, um, images of their work. And then after that, we will have a, a question and answer session. Um, so as, as an audience member, if there is a question that comes to you in the middle of their presentations, feel free to put it in the chat box, and then I will work my way through all the audience questions. Um, at the end of the program and hopefully we'll have time for everyone's questions. So I will start by introducing um, Josue and I'm gonna read these. And Josue, forgive me if I pronounce anything incorrectly. <laughs> Josue Rivas is an indigenous futurist, creative director, visual storyteller, an educator working at the intersection of art, technology, journalism, and decolonialism. His work aims to challenge the mainstream narrative about indigenous peoples, co-create with the community, and serve as a vehicle for collective healing. He is the 2020 Catchlight Leadership Fellow, Magnum Foundation Photography and Social Justice Fellow, founder of Idihina, co-founder of Indigenous Indigenous photograph and curator at Indigenous TikTok. His work has appeared in National Geographic, The New York Times, Apple, Nike, and Converse, among others. And uh, Josue, feel free to wave so everyone knows who you are. <laughs> Next, we have Sebastian Hidalgo, who is an award-winning visual journalist and digital producer who uses photography to engage and explore today's social and humanitarian issues affecting <clears throat> communities of color. He is also an educator and co-host of The Visual Desk, which is a bi-weekly editorial support group for freelance visual journalists inter interested in a more inclusive approach to serving communities they engage in. Hidalgo comes from a hyper-local and civic journalism background, having freelanced for more than four years in underrepresented neighborhoods in Chicago, and has also completed two City Bureau fellowship cycles. Um, he has covered a range of stories, including the social and cultural effects of gentrification and displacement in Mexican-American neighborhoods for longtime residents, high property taxes in American suburbs, Donald Trump's zero tolerance pilot program, and the mental toll of wrongful convictions. Hidalgo believes in the shared power with community members. Um, by growing in conjunction with the people who are in front of the camera as a witness and a bridge, and in some cases as a collaborator. So thank you both so, so much for being here. Um, we would love to see the presentations. Um, doesn't matter who starts first. Uh, do you guys have a preference? <laughs> yeah, Rock, I'm paper, like, scissors. He's like, I'm going second. You, oh, you, oh, you mean, we're, okay, let's do it, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> you want to? Let's do it real quick. Sure. Yeah, yeah real quick. Rock, rock, paper, scissors. All right, hold on. Uh, rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Oh. 
rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Okay, you won. <laughs> so you I first. go first. Okay, guys. Gotcha. Yeah, so you go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me know if y'all can see this real quick. Thumbs up. Cool. So I'm gonna uh, just briefly write up the, a bit of a disclaimer. I'm reading from like a, a, a script of mine only because I have some facts here that I want to get correct. Um, but nonetheless, I'm really excited to just be here with you all today and just uh, have these conversations. I think they're super important and I look forward to seeing what, what comes up of them. Um, but to kind of start off, I think it helps to start from the beginning and briefly just talk about my first project in my own uh, community in, in, in Pilsen in Chicago. Um, to give context to it, Pilsen is super tiny. It's a tiny neighborhood uh, a couple miles west of downtown Chicago. Um, we can choose to acknowledge its historical significance to the labor movement, uh, its contributions to the art and mural movements. Uh, we can choose to acknowledge its, um, its vulnerabilities call them by their names in hopes to build some form of research or resources, or just to acknowledge that they're absolutely real. But of course, kind of growing up in Pilsen, we, we didn't know any of this. And it wasn't until, I would say for me personally, it's, it wasn't until the, the shock of breathing in clean air for the first time, uh, clean air filling my lungs and wondering like, what is this? Uh, that really sparked this idea that we should begin to question everything that we previously thought of as normal. So as I did the research and started asking these questions, uh, there were two sides of a story that didn't really make sense to me, uh, to my young eyes at the time. You know, when I heard things like resilience, I saw my mother struggle with three kids, um, so resilience for me meant that we were surviving. A poquito, a poquito se llena el cantanito. Little by little, the jar gets filled. It's the, the, the saying of endearment that we would tell ourselves just to make it through the, um, through the day, through the week, you know, and so forth. But another aspect of growing up in Pilsen was I noticed that we were often, and what it what it meant to grow up in Pilsen is, is just kind of these false narratives that were around us. We were vulnerable to the false narratives and the headlines that only depicted Pilsen for its gang violence. Uh, we were vulnerable to environmental hazards from nearby coal power facilities um, that cost severe asthma attacks or uh, cancers and, and stuff like that. We're also vulnerable to political negligence that prevented long-time residents in Pilsen, which at the time were predominantly uh, Mexican, working class, multi-status, multi-racial population. Um, we were denied access and we were denied any sort of avenue to advance social economically. So for a time, I, I left Pilsen to care for my grandfather, who you see here in this photograph, in Mexico, in between the borders. So we would cross back and forth. I would go to school, come back, and help my mom who uh, to care for him when he was in hospice. And just being the youngest of three children, um, you know, it, I was present when he passed away, the only grandchild to be present during that time. And while that ignited this curiosity to photography and trying to show like the type of person that my grandfather was in, in some of his last moments, um, you know, photography came into the picture and I started to experiment to see like, how can this, how can I use this to communicate this to my brothers who weren't there at the time? You know, eventually I would return back to Chicago and what I found was 
a changing neighborhood. Uh, what we would refer to now as sort of the first indications of a neighborhood gentrifying. So this took the form of like joggers running in the evening past 630 at a local park or uh, the frequent police noise complaints happening around. So these were things that we were always encouraged never to do, to always remain hyper vigilant. Eventually, mom and pop stores uh, closed and were uh, refurbished to high end restaurants with high food prices and valet parking, which signaled to long term residents like myself and, and my fellow uh, community members uh, that we weren't included in these new plans. So eventually, a lot of people left and uh, you know, for one reason or another, they either got bought out or they just couldn't afford the increasing rent prices in the neighborhood. So historical murals vanished, you know, replaced with gray paints uh, and this really violent way of erasing a history. It's literally gray washing uh, uh, entire history away. And residents were kind of left with a deep emotional wounds that cut deeper over time. Part of the change that happened in Pilsen was uh, the newcomers weren't Catholic and churches began to struggle and close their doors and took with them valuable resources that were still needed for a lot of folks uh, in those areas. We would say things like, oh, there goes the neighborhood or Pilsen is becoming the next Wicker Park, which is a neighborhood north uh, and sort of northwest of Chicago that was predominantly Puerto Rican uh, that gentrified in the 80s and 90s and is really a different place to what it was back then now. Or we would say, you know, don't Brooklyn or Pilsen, right? So what hadn't changed from all this was a sentence in books that depicted an experience in Chicago, a black and brown experience in Chicago as being misunderstood and overlooked. That hadn't changed. So what was overlooked was this idea uh, that despite violence that we were faced with, we actually found uh, what it means to be in community with one another. Uh, as Horowitz in 1983 mentioned in the book, The Mexican Experience in Chicago, uh, residents establish resources for themselves when governments fail, or Pilsen residents decided to stay for factors uh, that they couldn't immediately resolve. So, you know, the first project was titled The Quietest Form of Displacements, which specifically looks at these social forms of a changing neighborhood. In other words, it's the feeling of feeling homesick for a community you still feel a part of, uh, or uh, like having a rock in your shoe that irritated you from time to time. These experiences isolated us from establishing new relationships with newcomers who did not understand or did not know what this felt like, or just by the struggles that, that we had to go through. And eventually what ended up happening is we, due to that isolation, we became complete strangers in our own neighborhood. So there was a lot of lessons that I learned as a photographer, as a photojournalist uh, in Pilsen, photographing the social effects of gentrification. One of them is this idea of collective grief. Um, but I think even now I have a hard time trying to articulate its complexity. So Cristiana Rivera Garza in her book, Grieving, which I recommend to everybody, it's really good, uh, Dispatches from a Wounded Country, she sort of writes it best. She says, uh, the importance of suffering for where suffering lies, so too, I'm gonna move this little icon real quick, does grieving. The deep sorrow that binds us within emotional communities willing and able to face life anew, even if it means, or especially when it means, radically revising and altering the world that we share. 
It is impossible to grieve in the first person singular. We are always grieving for someone with someone. Grieving connects us in ways that are subtly and candidly material. Whoops. So, you know, some of the lessons and, and further questions that, that developed over time after my own displacement from Pilsen in 2019 uh, was considering like what role photographers can take uh, in the presence of collective grief. What can we learn from one project to the next? What can we learn from Pilsen's history to the next community and so on and so forth? Um, and for me, it really is about collaboration. It really is about trying to ignite those pathways to heal. I think that's always been Pilsen's history and I carry that history wherever I go naturally because I'm a part of that community. Um, but Judith Herman in her book, Trauma and Recovery, describes healing as only could be achieved in the context of relationships, meaning that there has to be some form of agreement, there has to be some form of, of uh, uh, collaboration in order to make quote unquote successful images. Um, I did not create the standard of good or bad, so the idea of successful images and the way that I use it here is this community building, this relationship building and trying to find ways to, to do that. And sometimes it looks different in, in a lot of scenarios. Sometimes it's uh, purely for documenting uh, a situation, documenting a story, telling the story. Um, it's more about the process than it is about the overall outcome. Right. So in, in other scenarios, this collaboration, this relationship building that photography has the power to create can also look like being in fellowship with your peers and trying to pass down knowledge um, in a way to think about it, how we report differently than what was traditionally journalism, uh, centering people within the context of stories like environmental pollution, environmental injustices, or centering people in the idea of the social effects of, uh, or the psychological effects, I'm sorry, of social issues like gentrification. So I wrote about this very briefly in a, in a blog, but being in these spaces, uh, I often hear we still, debate this idea of being objective. Uh, like it's objectivity is like a moral quality to strive for. I believe that's it's false um, and that it's both harmful for the communities that we report with. And it's also harmful for the photographers themselves because we're always in this constant tug of war of trying to be objective instead of striving to achieve a, a, an objective moral quality, moral stance, I think a healthy way of thinking about it is really looking at it as a tool and nothing else. So being neutral or objective as a tool allows us to give space to listen without judgments, without biases, without agendas, for a storyteller or replacing the term sources with storyteller, uh, especially if they've dealt with like some form of trauma. Grieving, sorrow will always be present within the world. And by being and remaining neutral as a method to interviewing or to collaborating with photography also affirms uh, to the storyteller, to the person telling us the story, that they have a choice in the matter, that we can call the atrocities for what they are in the hopes to acknowledge them as Cristina Rivera Garza had, uh, had mentioned. Um, but that also is to really adopt or commit to some form of follow-up with it. I'm still trying to figure out what that looks like in the presence of great grief, um, because grief will be, will always be present in our lives. Um, 
but by remaining neutral allows us that initial pathways to see what works and what doesn't work uh, to collaborate to some degree. And I, and I think that photography and part of the lesson that I learned from just doing all this stuff uh, is that it never is just a one-off thing. It never just happens uh, by itself. There is always some uh, agreement to share space with one another. And the question is really, what do you do with that? And how do you follow up with that? Can we follow the path of healing? What does that look like? Um, so a student of mine recently had asked me, why do I always look at things that are hard to look at? Why do I always look at things that are, you know, people grieving all the time? And it kind of threw me back a little bit because it was, she misunderstood the whole purpose of this. It's not that I like to see things that are grieving. It's because I've made a commitment to myself a commitment to my grandfather, a commitment to my own community that I love them, you know? And I think that's like the baseline to everything. Once you love something, a community, a person, a thing, a space, sometimes it looks hard. Sorrow and grieving is part of love. And I think in this position that I'm in as a photographer, really have to dive deeper into what that actually looks like and what and why I photograph something like grief or take out a camera in the presence of grief. Sometimes I'm called to it and sometimes it just naturally happens. But, you know, I kind of want to leave you with that idea that photography is never really created by itself, never created in a silo. Um, there's always some community aspect to to creating images. And, and I think being honest with ourselves in that process, we're able to acknowledge it and find ways to heal from it. Cool. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was um, incredibly powerful and beautiful. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, Josue, would you like to go next? There you go. Now, now I'm, uh, I'm speaking. <laughs> um, here you go, yeah. Um, thank you, Sebastian, for the great, um, yeah, I love your work, man. I, I think that, you know, since I've known you and, and seen your work and how you practice, um, it's been inspirational to me. So, so thank you for sharing a lot of that. I didn't know some of those details and, and it just makes your work more, uh, yeah, more, more powerful in my eyes. So um, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so I think, you know, this this statement that the future is indigenous, it's it's a it's quite an interesting thing that as I present this, these images and these stories, uh, I, I every time I, I, I learn something new, right? So uh, I think that this idea that the future being indigenous is it's something that it, I think it goes beyond image making and photography and, and storytelling. And I think that uh, I want to want to kind of start with that that idea that we're talking here about something much bigger than ourselves. And I'll start with a quote from one of my favorite poets, um, John Trudell. He said, every human being is a raindrop. And when enough of the raindrop become clear and coherent, then they become the power of the storm. And for myself as an individual, and you know, as a as a person who grew up in in Mexico and, and had a deep relationship with with the land, you know, in, in our homelands, like in Guanajuato, and also a deep relationship with um, 
with the conflict between the you know the Catholic Church and and in indigenous ways of life, um, language language being taken away from my grandmother at an early age, um, and being forced to you know to only speak Spanish and, and to you know only praise one God. I think that looking back in retrospect, a lot of that affected me without even knowing, without even being being born yet. You know, I think that I walked into this situation where. Um, the effects of that same colonization affected my father to be um, addicted to alcohol. So very early on, I I struggled um, and and unfortunately ended up on the streets. Actually, uh, at age seven, well, um, my father and my mother separated, and, and I ended up uh, on the streets. My mother came here to work. So um, a lot of that that grief, you know, to a certain degree. Like Sebastian says, and a lot of those uh, wounds, intergenerational wounds, uh, were carried in my body and were also carried in in my soul, in my spirit. And through the process of understanding myself, especially as I got a little older and and we migrated to the United States, I lived in you know when I was eleven years old, um, I started realizing that the the image that my father was making constantly, which, you know, my father's a photographer. He, oh, he was a photographer. He passed away from COVID two years ago. But um, seeing that these images that my father would constantly make, right, of like quinceañeras and baptisms and um, all these different things that were so human-based, you know, so community-based, um, I also had a, 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 a lot of hate for those things. You know, I, I used to hate images. I used to hate photography. Um, and and it wasn't until I I turned around 21 years old and and went through uh, a lot of very beautiful ceremonies with my community that I was able to understand and and really you understand that the pathway forward to you know to forgive my father and to also um, understand how I was gonna show up as a father right like how, how would I ever be something that I wasn't shown to be um, so at that time my father called me for the first time in 11 years and he actually said that he was gonna send me a camera and that is the camera that, that you see here. It's a little Minolta camera. Um, and then I eventually you know, had my son, my son Tanati, who I think in, in that process of, of using imagery and using storytelling to understand my own situation and really to understand my own wounds, and and moving forward, like how would I how would I transform these wounds into into love into joy, you know? And um, my son, uh, early on, he picked up the camera just by himself, and he would photograph me whether it was a Polaroid or whether it was you know our digital camera or even an iPhone or even film cameras. Like he's always constantly photographing me, which I always found to be really interesting because that. To me, the, the image making process and the storytelling uh, tools that we have as humans right now are so rooted in, in healing and we don't really understand that yet, I think. I think we're um, constantly uh, looking away from, from the power of, of images. Um, eventually, as I got a little older, I ended up at Standing Rock. Um, at this point, I had, worked a lot with like houseless folks in, in Orange County where I used to live. And, you know, I, I was using the image and the camera really as a tool for me to connect with people around me. And especially people that I I had sympathy for and, and um, you know, I wanted to be closer because when I was, you know, when I used to live in the street, I really wish somebody would have come and ask me how my day was or, you know, if I if I had any aspirations in life, you know? And then I think that um, by doing that, eventually he trained me really to be able to show up to a place like Standing Rock where um, I'm sure a lot of you heard about, but you know, it was, it was a, an epicenter and, and really a vortex of um, much, something much bigger than a protest. I think that it was the awakening of, of humanity, if I'm being completely honest. And that's what it felt like to me in my experience. It was something that our descendants are gonna talk about for a long time. And also the, the prayers and the intentions that were planted at that place, at the sacred fire that they had in the middle of the camp, um, 
it's gonna it's gonna resonate with time. Um, the the seven months that I spent there, living at the camp, were transformational for for myself and also for the, those same wounds that that I I share about earlier. Right? How how do I how do I show up not only for myself, but how do I show up for a community? And I think that understanding that the camera was a tool for not only you know documenting or you know experiencing, but rather for this collaboration, like Sebastian is talking about. Um, that was the that was the the intention. There is that let's not just make images for you know coming in here for a weekend and hoping to get a little bit of images about, you know, the, the, the movement, but rather being in it. And, you know, like I had a lot of times where I had to go and make dinner for 40 people, you know, before I photograph, um, because that was like kind of the protocol, right? Like you show up and you you help and you show up and you you work with, with the people so that the people have um, an understanding that you're there, not just to extract, but rather to regenerate. So through that process, I also started coming um, and facing very real um, conflicts in, in, within myself, within uh, the industry that that you know that we call photojournalism, or or you know, you know now we call visual storytelling. You know, it's, it's very much. Um, I think that the moment where I realized a lot of people like me are not in these spaces. Um, I remember going to, to the Magna Foundation Fellowship in New York for a month, and we ended up going to all these different editors, you know, New York Times, you know, Net Geo, um, Time Magazine, and the amount of indigenous faces that I saw, I was probably like two people throughout the whole time that I was there. And then I realized that that was a, there was a, there was a lack of diversity, obviously, but also a lack of perspective, and that we were operating in a paradigm that was very old, you know, since the beginning of photography, that we were still admiring the, you know, the the paradigm that celebrated, you know, the long wolf going into a faraway country and coming back with images of children dying or being malnourished, you know, and then becoming the hero. Um, and and I didn't want to be that. I, I told myself, I I I well, there has to be another way out of this. Um, so through that, through that process, um, we co-founded what is called Indigenous Photograph, which is a database of indigenous photographers that is now worldwide. We have about uh, 70 different photographers throughout the world. Um, and then through that same process, I started thinking about my own role as a storytelling within indigenous spaces. Like, what is my role? Am I really supposed to just show up with my camera and like be the one that knows how to do the thing? Or what if I, sh what if we share that, the process and the experience of doing this together? So that's where this uh, project, the Sandy Strong project came to be, where what we created was a space for indigenous peoples to tell their own story and also to make their own image. So instead of me being the photographer, I became more of a collaborator and a, and a facilitator of space, really. It was a lot of conversation, a lot of this is how you do things, this is how you process an image, this is what this means, you know, this is what aperture and shutter and all these different things mean. But most importantly, do you feel safe in this space? And do you feel safe enough to tell us what your vision of the future and, and, and what you think you want those descendants, those people that you'll never meet, what is a message for them? Because when you look back at the imagery of indigenous peoples from, for example, the 1800s and the images of like Edward S. Curtis, and even up to now, like, you know, uh, I think his name is Nelson, but it's like another photographer who's like, you know, people are subjects and people are, you know, they're gonna be gone. So we gotta like photograph these less Indians type of thing. And it's like, well, like, that's not really true. Like, we're here, we're still here, and we're gonna continue to be here. Um, and humanity is gonna depend on indigenous peoples. And you know, just, that's something that I truly believe. So through that process is like, well, how can we make this image? How can we make sure that the, the person engages with their own image? They pick the photograph, they make it, they write on it. And through that process of, of engaging, something emerges from themselves and something transforms. And 
when I presented this this project at first in the in like you know some editors and things like that, it was just kind of like you know you can't do that. Like that is not being biased. Like you're you're doing something completely different. This is not photojournalism. And and then I was like, yeah, that is that is not photojournalism because the future, aside from being indigenous, the future is gonna be collaboration. And that is not just for 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 photography or for you know projects. It's like that's gonna be for humanity. So through the process, I eventually, you know, we all got hit with the pandemic and um, yeah, that was a transformational moment for me. And, I, and I'm still healing from that, uh, if I'm being honest. I think that having uh, honesty and, and being able to, to speak clearly about what that all meant for, for, for the individual and also as a collective is really important for me. Especially the protests during the here in Portland during the George Floyd, uh, yeah, when you know George Floyd was brutalized by by these police officers. Um, for me, it was like, well, what is my place in this whole thing? Like, why why am I gonna go out there and try to make these images when there's so many amazing like black photographers already doing this work that live in Portland that get overlooked all the time? So. I decided that I was gonna go out there in service of the community members that invited me out to the protest. And we ended up, you know, photographing things and then making posters of those same things for the next day for the protest and kind of just using the image as a tool for the community and not just for the extraction of what, you know, what a lot of times in media, you know, we, we tend to do, you know, it's just like, what is the next fresh thing? Um, Instead, we were working together constantly with the community members asking, well, what is the imagery that you want to see? Like, how do you want to be portrayed? Because that is my job as a storyteller is to make sure that um, that we're holding space for you, just like in the other project, you know, creating these safe spaces. And eventually I did this, this, this um, you know, to talk a little, a little bit about this because it's important that the idea of the photo session and the language beyond behind photography um, to be optimized at this point, to be upgraded. Like we can no longer be using words just as shooting or taking or capturing or even subject because the root of those words and, and the way that they're being used in society are constantly uh, attached to violence and especially violence against people of color or minorities or people that are uh, in the shadows of society. So this project that I did with my friend Amber, uh, she's African-American and also Muscogee Cree, uh, Native American. So we, we went to this, uh, this statue of George Washington that fell down here in Portland that came down to the protest. And then we went there to, you know, Aside from that, how we felt about George Washington and colonialism, it was much more about the space, like transforming that space and reclaiming that space and showing up you know, with, with good intentions. So what we did is we, we smudged the space, we had a little ritual before that, and then we photographed. And then that photograph eventually ended up in a huge, a huge wall in downtown Portland where um, we were invited to put it up. So really thinking about the image as a tool for transformation and also for um, processing wounds. Um, same thing here, when the pandemic happened, it was very much about how can I make, how can I still make images even if I'm in my house? And what we ended up doing for this project was making images over FaceTime with different indigenous uh, people that I know in, in my community and just kind of checking in on them, just saying, hey, like what's, how are you feeling? How, how's this hitting you? And, and and vice versa. So um, not being limited by the, the situation, but rather embracing the situation and then seeing how we can make something together. Which leads me to um, this creative, you know, we call it a storytelling ecosystem that we have, um, have a, you know, has emerged from the last few years of me doing a creative practice. And, and this uh, project is called Indigena and our, our goal is to, you know, to use creativity, collaboration, and innovation as a vehicle for collective healing. And, and that can mean so many different things to so many different people. And then we also want to ignite these paradigm shifts by telling stories for past, present, and future generations. So remembering that our stories are circular and not linear. 
Um, and through that same way, we started working in these different campaigns with um, community, certain brands that were aligned with, with the values of the community, and then with our organization where we were able to, again, challenge, again, challenge the, the status quo and really the, the way that people do things. You know, like when you look at a Nike commercial, most of the time when they go to a community, those people don't get paid that much, but they'll pay like, you know, a, an athlete a lot of money for that commercial. So it's like, how do we make sure that we collaborate in a way that, uh, sorry, this is, this is just a little video, but how do we make sure we collaborate in a way that it's not extractive, that the same way that we use storytelling for, you know, demonizing community, we can use the same exact storytelling to allow the community to speak in their own voice and in their own way. And that's what we did with, with Levi's. Um, we were with an indigenous school in Los Angeles where we were able to uh, hire like students and alumni to become the, the producers and the photographers and the creative directors, the cinematographers. And instead of going and outsourcing, you know, this, this crew that, that, you know, that will come from New York or even LA, um, we work with the community for them to do it and for them to tell us how they, how they wanted it to be done. Um, and that was a beautiful process. And it was a longer process than what I think a lot of people expect. A lot of people expect you to turn around things very quickly and, and in a very specific way. And what we did is we said, if we're gonna do this, we gotta do it in a way that truly aligns with the values of this community and with the values of our organization. So um, I see that is a big part of the, what we're gonna be doing moving forward is making sure that we are a bridge for culture, community, and also for creators and for, for people to remembering like what that word even means, like to be a creator, it's you're manifesting something that is very powerful, which is saying that you are one that creates. And I think that we use the word so loosely in, in society, especially right now with TikTok and with all these different social media platforms. Um, I'm gonna go into the next one. So the photography, like I said, the, all the imaging was done by, by indigenous creatives and people working uh, closely as production partners and, and um, their voices being at the forefront. Especially here, we work with a local tribe, the, the Gabrielian Soshone peoples in Los Angeles, and we um, we were welcomed by them and they were part of the, of, of the, of the piece. And um, that's another part of this whole work is that we have to remember how to show up properly to community. Um, Last thing is this project with the data that so we just did at Staining Rock, where um, we work closely with uh, Pharrell Williams and, and the Adidas uh, with their human race uh, brand and, and co-created this very beautiful story with the Staining Rock youth. And for that, we were able to hire an indigenous photographer and indigenous creative director, indigenous uh, videographer as well. And really understanding that that the way that we do things, you know, it, it's a little different and, and that is totally okay because at the end, the, the product or the, the piece that people see as a product uh, is done and given to, to this, you know, corporations really. I mean, and it's a, it's a really very real thing to say. Like, we're not working with, you know, nonprofits here. We're working with people that are gonna go and make money off these images, but the reciprocity and the way that, that, that we push these corporations to, to move their resources into the community was really important. And for this one, there was a solar panel uh, installation that um, basically covered a lot of the needs of the, of the tribe uh, in that specific region of Standard Rock. So that was really, really powerful. So I'll leave you all with this, is, is understanding you know, what is the stories that you want to offer to the future generations. And, how are you healing in, in this process of, of even telling your own story? Because I think that nobody can tell your story better than you. Um, that's Okamati, thank you so much. And uh, that, that's, that's that. Thank you so, so much. That was amazing. Um, I think what you said about uh, the lack of diversity um, in the photographic uh, or photography industry really uh, struck a chord with me personally as well, because I often wonder like what the collect collective vision or perception um, that's being offered when there's so few people of color that are 
doing the sharing. So that was wonderful. Um, I know we will have plenty of questions from the audience, but I would love to start with one or two of my own um, because I have a lot I want to ask you guys. Um, thank you again for sharing your work. Um, so images we know are powerful and uh, they carry a lot of weight and invoke feeling from others. And I wanted to ask you both what your thoughts are on healing through images and through visual storytelling. Uh, I, I guess I'll go. Um, you know, it, healing is, it's, 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 it doesn't have to be a complex thing. Um, I think the ways that we go about it can be extremely diverse. You can look in, in a whole different ways and methods, but in terms of photography, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, primarily speaking as a, as a documentarian or as a, as a documenter or a journalist, um, it's, it's an always constant thing that we have to think about, even in the presence of, of where healing is needed most. Um, I think it's easy, and if I could use the example of the personal or the individual right now, uh, it's easy to deal with a lot of the pain and trauma as if it's like enormous, it's uncontrollable, it's, it's all this weight is just piling on. But I think to remind ourselves that, that the pain of one is the pain of all and the glory of one is the glory of all, if we acknowledge it, if we go through it, we can really feel in community with one another. So for example, the whole first project of dealing with Pilsen's displacement and eventually dealing with my own displacement was a way for me to retain what we were losing, but also being those conversations about, hey, are you okay? You doing okay? Like, let's talk. Um, and you begin to realize that there are little tiny indications uh, that speak to that philosophy that your pain is everyone's pain and your glory is everyone's glory. From the writings on the wall, uh, reading between those lines and just really trying to, to, to build those resources, build that reach to have those conversations about like, hey, you know, we're struggling in this very similar way. How are you dealing with it? And can we be in, in community and conversation to see how we can do this over here together at the same time? Um, that's important. I feel like that's also the power that photography can have, especially now where you have an enormous platform called the deep wide web, um, where that access to those things are easily accessible for those that are looking for it. Sometimes we have to go out and do it ourselves just to kind of focus a little bit deeper, to focus a little bit more to say like, hey, um, we're here too, you know, we gotta, we gotta do this together especially now. I mean, I think as a journalist, we're consistently flung into situations that are, you have to be really careful and, and for a moment just not make sense of a tragedy, like a mass shooting. Instead, just kind of showing up and being like, hey, I'm here, not trying to make sense of the situation, just to have conversations with you. And if that means not taking the picture, that's okay too. Maybe it's a portrait, maybe it's, you're expected to take hundreds of pictures, but you only end up taking one because you're being in collaboration or communication in that way is more important in those moments. So it's navigating those situations and learning where to apply these methods that are most important and could look like avenues to healing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the, um, to me, to me, you know, I don't, I don't really consider myself a photojournalist anymore. It's really interesting because I think that when I start thinking about how to, how do we evolve this thing, you know, like how do, how, I think like we're like 10, 15 years behind, you know, of, of what it could be, you know, like what the medium could, could become, um, and at the same the same time, it's it's not being afraid to talk about spirit or like spiritual things within the realms of creating or documenting, you know, like um, and I think that that's where healing comes into place for my for myself 
in my practice is um, knowing that if I put something much bigger than myself at the center of my practice, that that is gonna allow me to, to, to use that practice for something that could potentially transform and help people see the possibility of healing. And, and that has to come from myself. Like I have to do that for myself. If I show up for myself and if I have self-care and even like standing rock, right? Or even, you know, Sebastian has gone through probably like, you know, the masculine, you know, documenting, like all those things really affect you, you know, as a person and as a storyteller and as a journalist. So for me, it's like, I has to start within me. Like when I show up and do these projects or even if I do, a, you know, these commercial gigs, it's like, well, if I'm not good, then I'm going to bring the energy to the set and I'm going to bring the energy to the people. And that's not that's not going to serve them and that's not going to serve the larger purpose of this. So I think the healing through storytelling comes down to um, your own personal balance with, with where you are with your own healing and then also being able to um, share that as much as possible. And like I said, not, not even being afraid about about the, the possibility of talking about things that are much bigger than just like like the linear, you know, um, expectations, you know, like like what is the spiritual realm of like the shooting, for example, Sebastian, like I'm sure you probably saw some stuff that was like much bigger than just like, oh, there has been a shooting in Chicago, you know, like when in the north side of Chicago, like it's there's there's a lot moving, but we don't we can't even talk about it in foreign journalism because it's like supposed yeah. to be factual and it's like well what if i don't want to do that anymore <laughs> you know it's it's and interesting that you say that post to it because it's it's i feel like all my life i've been preparing for something as tragic as this even though that's like a really horrible thing to say um the experiences that we have in, in a place like pilsen with the, the, the gun violence and all that stuff i knew what questions to ask people because they're the same questions i ask myself right and not a lot of journalists that are dealing with this idea of being objective or asking, you know, is little subtle kind of questions, little subtle kind of, kind of details that you're right. You have to work on kind of yourself in order to, to know that stuff. Super hard, super hard. Well said. Um, we have some questions from our audience. I will read these off to you guys. Um, the first one comes from Jesse, who's watching on YouTube actually. And she writes, such beautiful work and passion from both artists. As a photographer, I'm interested in hearing your advice from someone for someone trying to get into the field as competitive as photojournalism. So any advice for a aspiring photojournalist? Um, I think I, I can share the advice that I often give people and is don't reach too far too quickly. Uh, there is value in your own personal stories and in your own communities that are needed within those fields. Yeah, journalism is very extractive. But there are ways to become less extractive through civic methods, community meetings, uh, going to um, or investing in communities, uh, doing all that stuff in your own community. That's the best way to start off. Don't worry about the competitiveness of it. That's we have to really reach beyond that idea that I'm better than you. It doesn't work that way. Um, but the advice that I can give is you got to start with yourself. You have to be in community and then eventually just start graduating out. That might take a while, but it's better to do that than to just jump ship and go overseas or go to a neighborhood that, that you're not familiar with and deal with imposter syndrome and all that stuff. Imposter syndrome could be a good thing. It can inform you that you have a lot to learn still. And the ways that you go about trying to learn that thing should be in the context of other people. Don't worry about the competitive of it. It's always going to be there. And you can love a newspaper all you want, but they will never kind of love you back. And as a freelancer, you had to deal with those emotions too. But the thing is, what you can love when you're starting off is your own community. Find out what that looks like, articulate it, uh, start there. 
my advice. I would say don't get into journalism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I mean, I would say, I would say, get it. I would say, this is what I would say. I would, if somebody could give me this advice when I was younger of like, don't jump into it thinking that it's going to be the thing that you saw from like Magnum Photos, you know? Like mm -hmm. people going to it thinking that, or like, you know, winning the Pulitzer Prize is like, all this stuff doesn't even matter. Like, it doesn't even matter in the sense of, if you're going into it because of those ideas that you, one day you're gonna get a Pulitzer Prize, like, or even like one day, you know, your images are gonna change the world, which I think all of us blindly think that sometimes. I think that it's almost like maybe getting to a place where you're trying to make something new. That's what I would encourage mm -hmm. young people to get into. It's like start, start, start coming up with a different, like different uh, genres and even different like formats. And if we want to call it collaborative journalism or you know, vicious storytelling or whatever it is, like try to get away as far as possible from like going into a newspaper and like you know trying to be accepted and you know getting paid. Like I used to remember I used to get paid fifty bucks as an assignment. I used to be like so excited be like oh my god i'm gonna go and like change the world with my photos and they don't really care about you they're you're just another person you know um i think that like building your own path and even creating your own form like even like a hybrid version of being a journalist slash something else you know that could be interesting and maybe that becomes a new a new genre i don't know i just think that so many photographers get into this and then the thing is going to be like this very large thing and then you realize that it's that is that is not, and then you're like, well, why not? It's like, oh yeah, because the gatekeepers of the industry are just they don't want this to change, <laughs> you know. They want it to stay pretty, pretty. I mean, there's like some diversity initiatives, and but in reality, they don't really want it to really, really change because then that means that the way that we're programmed as humans will be so different that it would just create a revolution for people. People start realizing that a lot of the stuff that we see, it's, it's yeah, just it's, fabricated, I, you know. What I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And so you're, you're touching on something that's really important to understand, especially for those that are starting off, uh, is just like the, the where journalism comes from. Um, you know, it's 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 really based on extracting information. It's really just based on that stuff. But I, you know, I would say I, I really, if you're interested in being a journalist, I, I say go full into it. Uh, and learn those lessons for yourself. Um, but don't, I, I would say that the thing that I could advise as a photojournalist is just don't, don't miss the details. Like don't strive too far. Just start very small baby steps. That's the best thing. And then eventually you'll get where you, where you envision or where you want to go. But it's just, it's having the faith that, you know, if you work out Monday through Friday for, a year, you're gonna see some results, right? It's every single day you gotta work on something little, 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 and having faith that it will work out eventually. Um, don't give up, I would say. Uh, and we need more civic-minded journalists in the field. Mm -hmm. Well said. We have several more questions, but we're gonna have to cut it short because I think we're at time. But thank you both so 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 much it was a privilege to hear what you had to say and look at your images thank you for sharing your stories um and um with that i wish you guys a good night and thank you so much for being here thank, thank you, you all thank, thank you also thank you bye. yeah bye